Is that? Nah, I think you guys are just making stuff up. What is going on? Welcome back to Tuesday. Russ, what's happening? What is happening? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. My glasses are really dirty. <laughs> I haven't even looked at mine. They travel the world with me. Well, yeah, mine are pretty And I never good. clean them. It's a big fingerprint on mine. <laughs> Teach me what's going on. Give Uncle Touchy a slap for me. You've had babies. Oh, my God. Why? Why would you even mention that right now? Horrible person. Horrible person that he is. I don't think he understands how bad of a person he is. All right. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, everybody had a wonderful weekend. We are going to be uh, doing some fun stuff today. So, uh, in the limited amount of time that we have, we're going to be showing Jen some of the basics of uh, non-metallics. Uh oh! What? Say what? What is this really a thing? You're gonna do this? Really? It is dungeons, dungeons and doggies. Dungeons Dog and doggies. Dungeons and doggos. Dungeons and doggos. <laughs> it's like a a corgi wizard. Yeah. Something or else. Something or other. Yeah. Something or else. Something. 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 Very cute. Yeah, it is. Yes, that's exactly what it is. All right. So. Think about how we're going to start this. We uh, we spent almost all of the stream Friday, at least I did, working on some non-metallic on our Vulcan. I say our Colots Vulcan, <laughs> right? So we went through and did all of it, right? I think we even finished, quote unquote, finished. So all none, of none of that is metallic paint. No, no, there's no metallic paint on him at all. So it's all just uh, it's really just three colors. It's um, it's uh, Dark umber, um, yellow ochre, and olive skin are two of those are our new colors, right? Because we've got the uh, the yellow ochre and the olive skin tone. That's all this is. It's those colors. So three colors gives you all of that gold, and it's really you know as we talk about right with anything you're doing reflective wise, it's all about control of light. It's all about painting where. The reflections happen, uh, how bright they go versus how dark they go, uh, because even the darkness, like on this wrist piece here, you know, that dark area in the middle is a reflection of something in the distance of himself, of, you know, whatever. Right? Dark spot on the top of his collar is like the reflection of his face in the metal on the collar. So you think about metal, you have to think about metal completely different than you do all of the other paints or colors that you do um, because of the reflectivity. And the, the more you paint what is intended to be metal, like you would a normal color, like we've done the green just bright to dark around the back of the thigh on the armor, the duller the metal becomes, the less it looks like metal. Eventually, it would just look like I painted, you know, yellow mm -hmm. uh, on him. You know, but as it sits right now, we've been able to control our brightness. We set up, you know, shine points through the shoulder so it gets brighter through the middle of the shoulder and, you know, looks like a reflective metal as opposed to just paint colors so all right it's uh we'll see there you go you asked for it i know so we'll do it all right so today we're gonna we're gonna let uh yeah jen shaved she yeah. uh she looks much better today actually i love how that was like what people <laughs> pointed out like jen you grew a beard <laughs> like that's the only thing that you notice that's different well you guys are very similar other than oh that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was good oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Or, or basically twins. Definitely. Basically twins other than the facial hair. <laughs> oh, that's a blast. All right. So first things first, uh, you're going to need some color. So dark umber. I think that that's already what's on here. I Is think dark I, umber? I think I already did dark umber. Or mahogany. Oh, maybe that mahogany. That looks like mahogany. Okay. Mahogany works too. Um, do you want it to be more of a coppery? Because mahogany could be fun. Okay. Right? So you want to keep with that? Sure. Yeah, because that's mahogany on there. And mahogany works well, and I'll do mine with mahogany as well. Okay. Just so we do. So if you give me a minute to catch up to you, I'll base mine in mahogany real quick. Okay. I'm just going to pick this random model that we have laying around, and we're going to do some work on his crown, his helmet that he's got going on here. Russell also said the hair color changed and he wasn't as pretty. He is pretty. So. <laughs> Mike's a pretty man. He's a very pretty man. Well, Careful, he might be in chat. I'll just throw back my legs and pollute Thanks, my Scientologist. With Scientologist, 20 months. Thank you, my friend. 
Welcome back, everybody. Like I said, I hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. We are going to knuckle down and uh, teach Jen hey, some of the fundamentals of uh, barking non-metallics. Darrow Studio, barking Darrow. Barking Darrow. D e r o. Darrow. Barking Darrow Studios. What's going on? So uh, Jen wants to paint on her Dungeons and Doggies doggo there. Mm -hmm. She wants to paint uh, some non-metallic, right? So some reflective material using non-reflective paints. As a matter of fact, our paints, if you have not used our monument paint line before, um, they are very matte finish. Um, I think that the mahogany we're using right now is probably the least matte of them all, and it's still very matte. So she has already based that lantern on the dog with mahogany, so we're going to follow up and do the same. Uh, mahogany is a very dark brownish red, as you can see, and it makes a great base for yellow metals if you're you know, trying to represent coppers, brass, bronze, things of that nature. Uh, bronze, maybe not. Bronze, maybe browns is, is a better, but for uh, like coppery, brass kind of colors, we'll, uh, we'll give this a go. Catch up to where Jen is with her model real quick. I'm very advanced. He has to catch up to me. Yeah, she's very advanced. She painted that like. <laughs> no, you obviously started off with a game plan. Well, I knew I was going to put like copper or gold or something over it a metallic so, color yeah yeah so even basing with mahogany and then doing a metallic color over the top like if you were going to use our metallic copper or yeah. one of our golds uh it works fantastic right because then you can thin your metallic out a little bit and let that base coat shine through and you get some really cool color shifting even with metallic paints our metallics aren't like thick and gummy uh, they still have a great opacity but they allow you to play around and do some really fun stuff uh, i think he has that's an eye but yeah, then you suggested that perhaps. Jen is never afraid to uh, spread her hobby not? wings to do some flexing. So she's going to flex her hobby it doesn't skills always for turn us all. Out enjoyably for me, but I don't know of anything that you have wrecked. Like you normally destroy well, in takes, the good sense everything that we throw at you. It takes. It sometimes takes me a while to get there, but I can usually figure out a way to get there. Well, yeah. All right, so there we go. Throw back my Chunky Baxter. My Chunky Baxter? What? <laughs> oh, that was a gift from Rocket Chicken. Rocket Chicken, thank you for that gift sub. Chunky Baxter, thank you and welcome. All right, so we're going to be using uh, one of our new colors that's coming out in the next expansion of paints this next month, uh, coming out in June. We just had a meeting about it today, so it looks like we're, we're good for uh, sooner than later. We'll have more updates coming in the next week or so uh, as we start actually putting paint into bottles. Uh, but yellow ochre is one of the colors coming out. So we're gonna give Jen some yellow ochre. And I'm gonna take some yellow ochre. And uh, the first thing that we wanna do is start blending. How, how about right here? You're gonna need to put out some mahogany for yourself as well. Because you're gonna be making a mix of these colors first. And we're going to talk about non-metallics, right? That's the, the gist of the stream today, is talking about and walking Jen through some of the preliminary steps of understanding how to do um, reflective painting, right, with non-reflective paints. Uh, so we do a lot of this on the stream. We paint, you know, uh, a lot of a bunch of non-metallic gold on our Vulcan uh, using non-reflective paints, but giving it that very reflective <laughs> look so that everything looks shiny like metal. And so we're going to be taking Jen from uh, zero to hero, hopefully. So the first thing I want to do when I do this is I'm going to take some of the mahogany and blend it together with the yellow ochre to get a color that's just a little bit brighter than the mahogany. About like so. Okay. And I'm going to start just giving it the general go round with brightness. So, you know, your brightness being on top. Let's assume that this guy is, you know, just basically highlighted with light coming from above. So I'm just going to, like you would paint anything, I'm going to take this first blended color 
and I'm just going to start highlighting the upper areas of everything. Like on his helm, I've got all these little. Now, does it matter? Like, am I am I looking at a certain spot yet that's going to have a more reflective? Not right this second. Okay. Right now, we just want to treat it as if it weren't a metallic. Okay. And think in terms of just making sure that you get a little bit of value sketched in like we normally would fill out some of the volume on the model. Mm -hmm. This first level is your brain doesn't have to turn upside down yet. Okay. We're still at the paint like normal stage. I'm just going to bring this blended color, which is actually a really cool color. Mahogany and yellow ochre, not mad at this. Finding ways to put highlights down, like you would with any nice. any paint. And I'm not using it very thin. I want it to cover. That's why I'm mixing the paint so that I get a color that's not too abusive on that mahogany. Kind of gives us a visual blend just by being so close in hue. Well, the yeah, or like and right into my where I had my mixed color, <laughs> like it got runny and went. Oh, so I have to remake it. Very unique color. It's like a like a light burnt umber almost. That we're getting out of this combo. Great base for uh, copper if you wanted to keep doing oranges. Keep adding more yellow into this too. So again, just going over, highlighting as if this was nothing special material, just painting. Right? Almost as if it was just going to be this kind of burnt umber colored helmet. So, that one. so I literally turned that off. How is that back on? Look who did it. Too. It's Mike. How and I rude. literally turned this off. I disabled this. Who re-enabled it? I swear to God, I turned this off during the stream. Why did you do that, Mike? Why would you do that? I have disabled that command. I will kill you. <laughs> Somebody went in and re-enabled the command. Uh, mod. Who has that power? I don't know. I didn't think anybody did. I thought we were safe. Obviously not. Well, huzzah, you bastard! I'll just throw back my <laughs> that wolf, and what's going on? My breeches with delight. Uh. How you been, Net? Good to see you. We are doing great. Same well wishes back to you, Net. Net Wolf, one of the longest standing members, viewers, amazing people that we have had the pleasure to meet here on the Twitcher Nets. Is that a thing? We just created it. <laughs> we just created the I Twitcher like Twitcher Nets.
Now, I am on areas like this where I've got this cone shape on the top of his head. I don't know if you guys can see how I've left a little bit of the mahogany showing through on any of the cylinder or cone shapes. So I've got a dark reflective space. But if you're you know moving fast, you don't have to worry about that. Tell me if I'm on the right track at least. Perfect. Okay. Just the top surfaces, leave that dark leave mahogany and all the shadowed areas like you're doing. Okay. Perfect. Just like you would any normal paint okay. job. One of the, the hardest things when doing reflective materials like metal, shiny metal, you know, is getting through your head that the, the metal itself becomes a form of light source on the model, right? Every time light reflects off of it, you wind up throwing light back on the model or giving yourself the opportunity to as well is kind of the, the way to put it. It doesn't always mean that it's going to light right back at it. It has to do with the angle and the sculpt and all that stuff. But the shinier the metal on a model that is that you're trying to recreate, the more that metal is going to become its own light source and reflect back onto itself, so on and so forth. First thing we are doing, like I said, is just setting up values as if it were a normal painted thing. Highlighting where you would normally highlight. Using this blended color, so we're not getting a lot of contrast out of it. We want this base layer to be a very kind of dull transition between dark and mid-tones. This goes, this is true of all colors. So if you're doing silver right now, maybe you lay down a, a base coat of black and you want to do silver non-metallic. So this right here would just be a black gray, trending more to black than gray. I mean, you want to be able to see where you're putting it down, but you don't want it to have a tremendous amount of contrast. It's literally just setting up that initial value and kind of buffer zone for us to not have our next colors go on and be super stark, dark to light. As you'll notice on all metallic surfaces, you get a lot of variances in value. I'm gonna be kind of rough and sketch some of this in. Notice how all I've done is add that combo color between the yellow ochre and the mahogany. That blended color between the two, and you can see some shadows starting to come out. Obviously, I didn't put that blended color into any of my shaded areas. The dips in between the ripples on the top of the helmet are still dark. Uh, the layer underneath the helmet where it goes back in right, has that oh, dome shape. Mixed and minis. Thank you so much for that. What is going on, everybody? Blood Wolf, what's happening? <laughs> Uncle Touchy, oh my god. Everybody's out to get him. Miniatures did, what's happening? Welcome everybody. We are uh, going through the motions on our two hour Tuesday show of getting Jen primered on doing some non metallic. She has never done it before. We're going to uh, play around with well, her huzzah, Dungeons huzzah. and Doggos mini. Throw back my legs I'm using and this, uh, my what is this? With Rat delight. Kings? Ready to roll. 21 freaking months ready to roll. Thank you so much. Twitch took your follow off. Damn it.
Happy Tuesday to you, ready to roll. Welcome back. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. How you doing? I think I'm done. Think you're done. Yep. Let's take a look. So Jen is going to be doing this little lantern on her doggo. And yep. Yep. Hey, so you've left. Somebody likes us. In between. Minister's Den. Thanks, Minister's Thank you Den. again. Yeah, so you've left the bottom dark. Um, you've got all of the top areas, like the ring on the top, all the top facing mm -hmm. facets on this lamp well, huzzah, huzzah. with that brighter I color. Looks good. Thank you, Casino Reads. With 24 months, liar. 24 Officially months, liar. you just got your official lying liar who lies logo. Congratulations, crowd, Casino. Crowd Congratulations. Let's get some hype in chat for Casino. Finally admitting in public that he is also a lying liar who lies. Thank you for all that support. All right. So now the goal is to um, start adding in oh, some yay. of... Did it get there? It got there safely. Awesome. I was worried. <laughs> That's so awesome. I didn't want it to get all bent and crushed. The uh, Now we're going to go in and we're going to start adding some of the reflective qualities to this. Right, so we're going to go with a brighter color that's going to move more towards just. Uh, Jen wants to make it kind of a brassy color. Um, I think with the amount of red that we have in here, we probably want to add a little bit of mahogany back into it, but we want to make it a lot brighter than we just did. So the only uh, funky part is going to be the amount of coloring we're going to have to do, but I'm thinking something like this, babe. If we just take a little bit of mahogany into it like that. So notice so, how from okay. there to there. Much brighter than what we just did. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm showing her, so you guys can see, right? Is that what we're talking, my, my freaking paper is a mess, right? But hopefully you guys can see here. So what we did initially is I've got the, um, the yellow ochre, the mahogany, right? We made this color first. We, we based it in mahogany, then we blended the yellow ochre and the mahogany to get this dark color. Now we're going to blend the, the mahogany into the yellow ochre to get this much brighter version of that color, right? Yep, I like it. Okay. Right? So you basically are just taking a very little bit of the mahogany now just to kind of give a rich body to that yellow ochre, right? Take that. Now you see you've got a much brighter color and we're going to start looking at where we think those reflections should go. Now, some of the things are gonna be easy, right? If you've got like, you know, these buttons hanging out are going to obviously have a glare on the top of the button just because they face directly up towards our light source. We could probably just, you know, sink that in there real quick. Um, on something like these surfaces here, I'm going to think to myself, it's not going to be right up at the top I'm going to look and I'm probably going to bring that reflection down somewhere right in here. Right? So I'm going to catch like right in the middle here a reflective line all the way across this helmet. Reason for that is the way a dome shape will reflect. You're not always dealing with your brightness being at the top of an area. In a lot of cases, right? It'll do like that halo you see across hair. So we can do like that. I'm using fairly sketchy strokes here. We'll be, you know, putting color on top of color so you don't have to worry about blending. Obviously, we're not wet blending or anything. We're just going in with dry paint over dry paint. And I want to make sure that I keep that. Going all the way around because in this case his helmet is flat on his head his his pose is pretty flat right so it's going to give me this haloed shine all the way around the trim so this is where i'm going to look at where it's going to be you got it from like reflective. basically from like okay. top down okay. and and think in terms of the this is the hardest part of of any of what we're talking about and it takes a lot of looking around in the environment around you to kind of understand why and where these reflections would be because this is the part where you have to start tuning your brain into the fact that it's not just going to be brightness at the top of a thing or towards the light and then darkness away from the light. We're going to start finding brightness and darkness 
you know, muddied in together in weird areas to give us that reflective quality. So if you want me to look at that lamp real quick and kind of point you out, or do you want to well, take some guesses and then show me? I missed a couple, like a spot on the other color. This will be the first color that you really start looking at how your edging is going to go, like across this kind of dome point on the top of his helmet. I'm going to grab the whole ring around there. Probably get a little bit of brightness on some of these. The shine right through there. Now, because I've located a shine point around here, right? So, like, take a look at this, babe. I've decided that, like, this edge is going to be bright. Mm -hmm. So, now that means that this edge in that same constricted area, right? Mm -hmm. If I say that my highlight goes from there to there, this edge would fall in there, right? The top of this rivet would fall in there, this one, right? And then probably some of this right here. And then maybe just a hair of this facing upward. Keep that shine location consistent so that if I tell myself I've got something bright happening right here, that mm -hmm. everything down from that is also going to be bright, but within those linear constraints, so side to side. Out here and right in the edge of this. Probably as this comes out from underneath that lip of the helm that we highlighted, we'll give a little bit of a, almost a triangular shape here. Highlight on that. Probably a little bit right here. Always making sure to leave that darkness, if we have it, at the edges so you keep the dimension First starting out to do these types of techniques, a lot of times it's better to not worry about specific lighting direction and just kind of do it as if, you know, the light was somewhere up top. And not try to focus on things that have like a hard left light or a hard right side light. So you're not forcing yourself into really crazy situations where like one side of the model is completely different than the other. Here, I'm just gonna base it on, you know, as being as symmetrical as possible on the way the light is bouncing off of this to make it easy. You'll still get a really good look, you know, if you have somebody looking at it and says, oh, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, they're just picking on you. Well, spots of shine in and around these rivets. I keep them away from the rivet, so the rivet itself causes a shadow.
How you feeling over there? Mm. Always ask me to look at it since we're painting different shapes. Hmm? It's not even close to being on camera. Very good. Yeah, you're not overtaking that other color, which is nice, mm -hmm. right? So your blended color is still showing, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. I think now, yeah, yeah. On like this backside, uh -huh. you know, do, you know, you want a little bit on the, Just a pick of the top. Okay. And then this little, see how it has this little thing right here? Uh -huh. It's another like little bead thing. Uh -huh catch that okay. as you start working into where you think you'd have shadow. Now, obviously this is a light, so it's going to work a lot different, but we're not going to deal with that right now. Oh, that's, that's right. Because this thing is a lamp that's causing light. So it's going to do different things. Don't worry about that right now. Okay. okay? We're going to do it as if there's no light okay. because it's too hard. It's one of those things that trying to do non-metallic on a lamp that also creates light is just way too hard. Oh. It'll look great at the end. Just don't worry about making it look too realistic right now. Because obviously if your light source is on the inside of this lamp, then all the brightest parts of the gold will be these stanchions, right? It right. will be will be these areas right. because the light's radiating from inside. So don't worry about that right now. We'll we'll work with that as we do the OSL. Okay. She's she's doing a very complicated thing here, right? Um, probably catch a little bit of like these edges. Okay. And you can even do the bottom edge okay. here, this edge. Yeah. Right. Where you've got hard edges will generally reflect the brightest. Okay. So do this edge, right? Uh, this little dot here. Okay. Up here, stuff like that. Okay. Right. Other than that, perfect. in and adding a little bit of secondary reflection around the crown head here. Goal being that you've got that what will be the brightest reflection, then darkness, then the secondary reflection. As we go through with the next brightest color, we won't add much of it, if any, into that secondary reflection zone. We'll focus on this outside area. But that'll give us that staged feeling of reflection. Now I'm just going to worry about this part of the crown. I'm not going to do the back part on the neck yet. I guess I should. Damn it. <laughs> like, I'm just skimping. I'm not going to do that part. <laughs> oh my God. I guess I should. Probably should. Do the brightest shine like right here. I'm going to pick on this neck cowl cover thing. Bring this, I'm going to leave a little bit of darkness down towards the very corners. Focus on the, the brightest point on this. And I'm just arbitrarily picking this to be right here. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to start showing some of this brighter color if I can get some on my brush to actually work. to be kind of narrow up here and just kind of skirt these rivets or studs. Have the shine get wider as it reaches the edge of the cowl. Right. 
again, just very rough. And on, you know, weird shapes like this, I'll probably come in and do another thinner line of secondary reflection down here. Yeah, this is from uh, the, I think, Dungeons and Doggos, Doggies. Um, it came from Impact Miniatures. Yeah. So check. They're super They're fun. They do have more. They have other Corgi. Are they all Corgis? Well, he showed us the ones at Adepticon that there was like the three-headed one. And Wasn't there a Doberman too? Or no, that was what you showed me, corgis. I think. Right? I don't know. Yeah, I think you just showed me something on the internet that was like Dobermans too when you were looking at reference pictures and stuff. Russ wants to know if there's a way to easily work out where the shine should be put. Experience is the only answer, right? Um, because, uh, so in general, what's going to happen, if you, if you talk, let's do a magic card moment here, right? So if we take and look at, like here, okay? So the way that metallic or any reflective surface, remember the way that we talk about this is not to think of it in terms of solely metal, but anything reflective, glass, shiny plastic, uh, obviously metals, things like that, is you have a surface, right? So here's a flat surface. So in a perfect situation, right? Think in terms of light and angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So pick your light direction. If you've got light over here, right? Off of the left shoulder of the model, our right, then if all the light is hitting here, then it's going to hit, right? And it's going to then come back this way off of a surface, right? These rays of light come down, reflect off of that surface when they hit it. And so when you look at this model from the offside, right? So when you look at it off of its right shoulder, you'll have that bright spot here and you'll see that brighter over here and you'll actually maybe have dark reflection towards your light, okay? Now this is not, like I said, there's no hard fast rule because the shape of the model interrupts this kind of uh, math very quickly, right? So like when we look at Vulcan, that we've been painting, right? All There's tremendous amounts of angles here. So we're just considering light coming down from the top. So we have obviously like our brightest shine spots kind of right here as the light is reflecting off and coming right back at your eye. You can pick it arbitrarily, right? And, and then what you wanna do is realize that this spot where light reflects directly back at you is then going to saturate color around it. So you'll have like, in this case, gold, you'll have less yellow show up around the bright area and you'll start moving towards ivory or white, whatever your bright color is that you choose. And then you'll start seeing the yellow color of the gold as you move away from that saturation point. That's the way reflectivity works. This is the light that's shining on him, reflecting right back off, right? And desaturating all the color around it. Your eye won't recognize. If this were a red sports car where the light reflects off of it, you don't see red. You see like white light or yellow sunlight. And then it's not until that diffuses a little bit that you start seeing red again. And so that's what you have to think about. And once you've placed one, so like if we started with Vulcan and we said, okay, this shoulder, I really want that shine to go right through the salamander head. And I paint it like this. Now you have to think in terms of how that light being in that location would react across all those upward facing surfaces means that you, if you have this reflection that goes linearly like this across the shoulder plate, notice how it hits the, uh, the shoulder plate here, comes across linearly here, and then starts tapering off down here. But it's this way, it's this horizontal to us right now. So you don't want to then on like another spot, right, pick a, a glow that goes like vertically on the other shoulder pad, right? If the shape is the same, you don't go then go vertically. On the back here, we went perpendicular because this peaks and has a spine. So this one on the backpack curves opposite, right? It curves this way, the shoulder pad curves this way, right? So what we've done is just set it up to where our curvature has that shine that goes right down the middle of it. And so we then fade off. And that's just the way cylinders work, right? So we've got the cylinder of the shoulder pad. You wanna make sure that you don't run like down this collar plate that has the same curve. You don't wanna run your shine this way. Make sense? it still wants to all go this way. So you'll notice how all my shine across does that same thing. Same when I'm looking at the front, I've created this shine like across the belly ring here. It kind of goes here, right? And then you recreate it here, right? And recreate it here. So that everything that's in that same plane of reflection, meaning, you know, sort of flat surfaces facing forward need to have that shine go in a similar direction. It can be different than this, right? Because they're different shapes, lights hitting them in different ways. 
you just want to make sure that you're looking at it and saying, okay, this guy, right, has got the shine, 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 and don't have like this guy with a bright shine that goes top to bottom. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's it becomes the 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 kind of a, the experience that you build and the process that you build in your head of looking at all the points on the model and saying, okay, I want to do his chest and I'm going to set up a shine line that goes across, right? So that it's the, the top of the skull and then across to a bright spot over here on this wing and a bright spot over here on this wing, right? And so you set that up, you make your shine work that way. And then you look at everything else that similarly faces the user when they're looking at the model and recreate that same shine. Right now, when you have something go off angle, like the knee kicks out, dips in a little bit, you can pick a totally different shine. You can say, okay, I want this to shine, you know, only on the left side or whatever. You know, here I just kind of randomly did it, right, for the stuff that was down low. <clears throat> but for your principal things, you'll notice how you see this shine line that goes across behind his head. Right, notice how I haven't made a bright shine down the length vertically anywhere because it would offset that, it would start fighting with it. So you leave that shine going horizontally. Same thing up here. They all kind of hit the tops. So I've kept that kind of horizontal shine feel on him, which brings it all together. If you start doing different angles of shine, if you take each and every individual piece and, and say, okay, the shape of this skull makes me really want to do the shine vertically, but the shape of this wing makes me want to do it horizontally, then you'll get this patchwork that won't look metallic. It won't fool the eyes the way you want it to. Right? But there is no like hard, fast way to tell you what to do. You get, you kind of get to pick it. You kind of say, okay, you know, like on this guy, there's really no rhyme or reason. I'm just like, I want the shine to be, you know, um, just top down. And so because it's a dome, right? He's got this domed colander helmet shape. Go into your kitchen. Is that an elephant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's an elephant. He's a very uh, Eastern Indian inspired, huh. you know. Um, Hindu-ish. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you've got a, a, a colander, if you've got a, a, a pot, colanders work really well, uh, if you can forgive all the holes in a colander. A colander like works a well. Pan. Open the colander up and then look at it, right? And you'd see a shine. And you just put it on the floor in your kitchen or on the counter in your kitchen and look at how the light hits it. And then just see, oh, it makes, it's not a shine that simply starts at the top and then gets dark at the bottom. It creates bands of light, you know? where you get a reflective thing that bends around this shape, right? You know, if you've ever gone to like the magic mirrors at the circus, right? You can just take a reflective surface and bend it just a little bit and it changes the way it reflects completely. You can become that short mm -hmm. midget look in the mirror, even though when you look in the mirror, it doesn't have this huge concave to it. It only takes a little bit of bending light to alter what you see. So anytime you have a surface, it's not flat. You can get away with murder. You can throw light at it in all sorts of weird directions and get crazy highlights and specular reflections and things like that. It's kind of up to you to play with it. Just remember that when you define those real bright spots, then you have to start looking at the model and say, okay, I've got a really, really bright spot on the front of his helm that then you know darkens as it goes around and no brightness in the back. Well, that tells you that the light is hitting from the front. And so now everything on the front is going to wind up giving me a brighter reflection than stuff on the back. Okay. We'll move on. Now you're just going to use pure yellow ochre. Well, huzzah, huzzah. I'll just throw back my legs and pollute Elric. my breeches with the Holy hell, oh, Elric man. has almost got his liar badge. What's going on? Tell me what's happening. Good to see you. So the shine usually goes the same direction, but it can go off a different way on other parts of the model. You got it. Yeah, because every angle of everything that's reflecting light changes, right? If you take, like I said, this is one of those where it really calls for experimenting in the world. And your kitchen is your best experimental device. Spoons, you know, we sit here and we talk about the spoon, our dirty ass paint spoon, right? This spoon, right, with its reflections, right, just moving it a little bit, look at that. If I tilt it up towards the light a little bit, look at how the light extends. That reflective quality gets a little bit more rectangular as opposed to when I move it down and it's like this is basically, now the light is reflecting directly off of the spoon and you're seeing the actual shape of the light. Move it, and it starts stretching and bending in weird ways. Move it this way, and it starts stretching. Look at this one, how it thinned out into a narrow line, but when I get back over here, it thickens out, <laughs> blurs a little bit more, right? So just even moving this mirror-like surface around changes the way that light reflects, and I'm not, mo I'm not you know, changing its angle entirely. We're just barely moving it. Right? Is that a spoon from our kitchen? Uh, maybe. <laughs> it's like the cheap oh. aluminum stuff that I had. Oh. <laughs> Stainless, it says. 
So no, it's not one of the ones we use normally, I don't think. Right? Yes. You know, and then you look at the way the handle reflects, right? Because it isn't just a dished shape, right? As soon as you have an, uh, an oval with a concave or convex surface, it tends to bring all your light together into more specific points. Notice how we see the lamp itself reflecting and it doesn't bend too much. I can force it to bend by throwing it into weird directions. But now look at how at the same angle, the handle reflects light, right? Mm -hmm. The handle now makes the light look like it's very long and linear. That's not the case. It's the shape has a linear edge now that it can, that this same brightness, the light's actually reflecting directly here and then transmitting down the length of this thing, right? Then as I alter that, you'll see. Notice how I bend it a little bit. Here's where the light is actually reflecting. And then of course here as it hits the bend again, right? So just a small angle change can change the way you paint the model completely. Here means that the light, when you get this much brightness when you're doing your metallics, it means that this is facing the light directly. Mm -hmm. As you start going away to other pieces of the model, you can't paint them the same way, right? If you've got the chest and you want to light it like this, and then the leg bends down, the leg's going to have to do something like this. Less brightness, still pinpoint brightness. It doesn't have to change the value. It's still just as bright where it goes to the brightest, but you don't get as much because it's not facing the light in the same way, right? Kishmid and I have the same question. Why is there a paint spoon? What is it used for? So that spoon was used to mix all of the titanium white back when we hand mixed our titanium white. For use a spoon, I shook it. So that's what we dished the paint from container to container before you shook it. Oh, well, like cups. Yeah, but I put it into the medicine cup with the spoon. Did no, you not? I don't recall doing that. No. You just not dug ever. it into the titanium white. We had big buckets of titanium white. How'd you get I, it in the medicine I cup? I had squeeze bottles. Uh -uh. I for sure made it only with a squeeze bottle. Oh, that was forever ago. Oh, yeah. yeah it was then definitely we started forever once, ago. Yeah. When we made the first batch, when we were testing, yeah. we probably did. Yeah, okay. But when we had the I big buckets, I had bottle. to use the spoon Okay, all the time. yeah, no, yeah. I just squeezed it. <laughs> it was very, very hands-on manual labor there. All right, so now what we're going to do, now that we've got the principal value set, we have our we have shadow because it still does have shadow, right? But we've also set up for some reflection. I've got this band of reflection going around this. It's a it's an oval shape and a dome. So all of my reflections are going to get bent around the outside edge of it. That's just the way that shape works, okay? Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to take some of the yellow ochre by itself and I'm going to go in on those areas that I marked that I wanted brightest. And I'm just going to pick a spot in there. I'm going to kind of go right towards the top of this area that I wanted brightest. And I'm going to lace in this yellow ochre. Right? So you've already told yourself by your last color where you want this yellow ochre to go. In this case, yellow ochre. It could be your brightest gray. right? Because it's just going to go at sort of the top edge of where you put that last color. Right? So, so you don't want to just... overtake it. You're just you're going to go back only in the areas where you put that last color mm -hmm. and now towards the top or wherever you want that reflection to hit mm -hmm. and start putting this color in. Okay. And this should be the I mean, it depends, right? I'm not going to tell you that, you know, step three is where it starts looking like metal. Depends on how bright of a color you're using. But with, with uh, reflective materials, the brighter you go, the more it should start to take on the feel of the, the material that you're trying to fool us into thinking it is. Now, because I've got these lines along the edges, I'm also catching a little bit of the edge. So you'll notice I'm doing a little horizontal and then I'm bringing, you know, little legs of color down. wound up thinning my paint down a little much on that last go to the palette because as it dries I'm losing
Yeah, you overtook it a little bit much. You want to, you less is better to start with, mm -hmm. but that's not bad, right? I feel like you can get away with that. Maybe as you have these edges here, right? Mm -hmm. Bring it a little bit along that edge, okay? Right, and a little bit along that. But you I mean you're barely any paint on the brush at all when you do this, right? Mm -hmm. You just want it to kind of catch like in little bitty areas like that. The key here is paint at the right consistency. If you thin it out too much, then you won't be able to get those fine details in and it'll kind of blur it all out. So you almost want to be at that point where you're, you're just a little bit of dampness on the brush, enough to get the paint to flow off the tip, but pretty close to paint right out of the bottle. Which means that as you're doing this, you'll be cleaning the tip of your brush and going back over to your palette quite a bit more than other things that you may be used to doing as far as your painting techniques go. Because generally by this point, you want the opacity of the paint to really ring true. You don't want to have to be going back over this area three or four times with this color because now is when you're starting to seed in, in most cases at the scales we work at, you know, more of your fine detailing. And if you have a problem, just go back over it with that previous color. No, you can... I just can't, like, my, it keeps drying. Oh, yeah. It's really dry. And I'm going to just kind of randomly pick side of this tone shape top spike here here I kind of follow along and then catch the edge Because I got that brightness, I chose that bright spot on the cone right there. I'm going to hit that same area below it on that edge. Got that brightness there. Just because on this side where I've chosen to do that, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of brightness in these few. up high there. I got to do the same thing over here. I chose that way, so I'm going to go this way over here for no particular reason other than it's on the back side of the model. It doesn't matter. One of the most frustrating things with non-metallic is that it's one of those where you have to pay attention to the world around you, right? It is not like a cheater method for it, really. You can you can sort of cheat, right? I think Kenny calls it like poor man's non-metallic when he just does high contrast. And it can work, right? It won't it will work like if you have one minor thing that you want to do on a model. You can throw you know, just high contrast and, and edge highlight on it, and you can make it look pseudo metallic. As soon as you have multiple objects on a model that you're trying to make do this, or multiple panels of armor, it becomes a lot harder to fool the eye into thinking that it's metal. This is just a mess. <laughs> Let me see. 
No, that looks great. Yeah, that's going to look great as soon as we hit it with the ivory. Oh, my God, that's going to look really good. It's so sloppy. No, well, okay, look at mine. Really neat. Look at it up close. So way neater. <laughs> I think you'd say that no matter I what. Get I think yours looks great. Right? The my paint just keeps drying on the brush so fast. Right, it's and so it will, hard. and it's frustrating because you're trying to use a very fine point brush, right? Well, I, I got a bigger one because I'm using a number two. Well, I have a zero because right. If you don't feel comfortable with a number two, it really will help in situations like this to be doing it with a larger brush than you might feel is necessary because of that. But no, this looks perfect, babe. It looks really good. And it's you're going to notice it pop, right? Then again, just hit those dots, mm -hmm. right? And those edges again, like you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Don't over edge this backside, just right. maybe a little bit on the top and let it be darker as it falls away. Mm -hmm. And then just the top of those little doohickeys there, a couple little lines, just keep doing what you're doing. It looks great. And remember that, you know, this technique, the first time you do it is going to be really a pain in the butt. It's going to be something that makes you want to throw away your paintbrushes in a lot of cases. Because it is not easy. It's not easy to, number one, understand. Unless you just have a knack for this stuff. Right? Some people just get it. That's fine. But if you don't, don't feel bad. Like I said, this color is basically just going in and retracing what you did before in smaller amounts. And really making sure that you're just not thinning your paint too much so it doesn't glom on and get all liquidy and flow around the model in weird ways because it'll make it look like there's just way too much paint. First two coats, well your first coat sets up the color right? Because it's going to give you the basis of your color. Your next coat is going to start setting up where you want the shine to go. Your third coat just follows right along that area that you set that shine up at. And then it becomes very simple. I feel like with non-metallics and any reflective paint method that the hardest part of it all is those first two steps of setting up where you want the shine to be so that it sells itself right and that beyond that it's literally just tracing over the same things you just did adding less and less paint each time that whole painting yourself into a corner that we talk about you just keep going over those same areas right so like right here i'm going to go right in over this same exact area across his temple but i'm going to pull my paint in much shorter strokes so that I don't overtake what well, I already had. Huzzah, huzzah. I'll just throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight. Paradu, what is going on? 30 need... freaking months. That's awesome. I need more paint. Thank you, my friend. Uh, more paint. Uh, you would like... Yellow ochre. Ye yellow oh, oh, that's right, because you don't have any. Sitting over there. Hold, please. It just gets...
again, right here on the bridge of the nose, I've got this shape laid out. I want the brightness to move towards the bridge, so I'm just going to basically stipple in this brighter yellow. Right along that edge, like that. So that mid-tone yellow then gives me that quote-unquote fade back into my dark reflections. I'm really digging this, ma this mahogany as a base for this. We're not going to go too bright on mine. I kind of like it. It's like a weird rosy gold. I don't know that rose is right because it's not pink, but. Again, just continuing wherever I've got that other lighter color and throwing this in there. I've also got to go back and I've got to hit. Part I like the least because you need to start edging all of your highlight edges at this point with this color. Got to go back on all of the helm like Jen was doing on her lamp, catching all those flat corners and such. I'm I'm working with a round object here, but I still have these sections where I need to catch this edge. Oh boy, the sculpt is horrible here too. Give me a lot to work with. I can't like run the side of my brush over it, so I gotta just kinda grin and bear it. I have to start giving an edge light all of these. The edging and the detailing that you do along your edges will really, really start to sell the metallic and the reflectiveness. Because like we just showed you with the spoon, light follows an edge. Talk about like path of least resistance for light. It goes along that edge without any hassle at all. It'll just shine, you know, as far as that straight edge goes from the spot where the shine hits it. And you'll see with every edge I put on there, the more you get that feeling of metal on that helm. Here I am using a fairly thin paint. I'm just not putting much paint on my brush. Drax, what's going on? This is from Wrath of Kings. From back in the day when Cool Man or Not sponsored the channel. We have a bunch of these test models. We've been using him, showing off everything from I mean, this. We set up, uh, like talking value, how to paint with uh, monochromatic. We set up the flesh tone. We did the texture on his skin. We used the same black. This was just black and white paint and mixing to gray to get shine for metallic, like on the links. And we did the armband the same way before we did the transparent over it. And doing the texture there and i think a little bit like on the leather bands yeah the leather straps on the back showing you how to paint with value so that you could get and denote using just you know black and white we kind of tested with him showing you how to paint different textures and have them show up on the model as different textures when you weren't you know relying on color to do it for you oh babe all right i want everybody to look at her lamp right now <laughs> it's freaking I mean, amazing it looks, just, it looks, just it looks so oh. good what are you kidding me? Look at her lamp. <laughs> Look at her lamp. She's killing it. She does this. She does this Eeyore act. Well, because I, I just see it differently than you do, I think. Like, to me, I just see, like, it just looks... Looking right there, you think that looks sloppy? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think that looks fantastic, babe. Yeah, I think it looks fantastic. 
you can also see from the difference between hers and mine what the difference is when you leave more of the mahogany showing, like how it changes the whole overall color of it. Mm -hmm. You forced a lot more of the mahogany back, so you're getting a really cool gold and brassy, mm -hmm. and just those shadowed areas are giving you the mahogany. I've left a lot more of the mahogany yeah. showing, and see how just that slight alteration of how much color you leave where can change the whole dynamic right, of the, yeah. the feel of the color. It doesn't change the metallic nature of it at all, mm -hmm. right? I think she's killing it. Armin's, what's going on? She was taking me from zero to hero? That's not a thing. What, are you kidding me? That was like almost an hour ago he said that. I've been horrible with chat today. <laughs> I didn't even come. Pixie Lou, what's going on? Again, sorry, we've been, we're digging in, trying to teach Jen some non-metallic. So it's a, it's a, a deal where, you know, she's going to go tunnel vision because this is a tough yeah. one. Sorry. Thank you, Ulti's. Yeah, right? Right, I do, LTs? I do appreciate it. it. just, my eyes just see it a little different. It's having a grin. Uh, Herodou suffers from the too much highlighting problem. It just looks so good. You keep going and you lose all the value. That's the problem, right? That's one of those things, especially with metallic, is that when you get to your brightest color, we call it the painting yourself into a corner. As you go brighter, you should go much less paint. Don't put much on till the brightest color that you use should be the least amount of paint on the entire model, but it has the biggest effect. One little dot of paint when we get to the end of these metallics will change the whole view of her lamp and this helmet. 100%. Just a tiny, like I'm using a number two, right? And just a tiny dip of paint off the tip of this brush on, on like this area of the helm right here is going to change how it looks immensely. And you get that feeling of, oh, wow, I did it. And then you start putting more paint on and you ruin it, mm -hmm. right? Because too much of that brightness brings all the value up and forgets the shine. It makes it all just look like an amalgam, like disco ball, we call it, right? You hear me use that term a lot. When people highlight, they paint just the boot. And they get so into the boot and they highlight it up and it's great. But it's, it's too high a value compared mm -hmm. to the rest of the model. Like, why is the boot the brightest thing on the model? Even if it's metal boot, the metal on the head is going to be brighter than the metal on the boot, no matter what, Right. And so if you highlight everything up to that level, you use too much of that bright paint, it gets disco ball. It takes too much vision and your eyes don't know where to look and you're directed all over and each piece looks fantastic, but the composition as a whole starts to fail. And so you have to be very, very careful. And that's why you start processing that. Keep that term in the back of your mind. We say it all the time, painting yourself into a corner. You paint until there's no place left to put paint. And so that directs you how bright you can go. If every time you put another color on, you only paint a line that's 50% as long as the color you're covering and use that as kind of your backdrop, then eventually you run out of space. You can't put another color on. And if you haven't been able to go as bright as you wanted, then you probably didn't push your shadows as far as you needed to because you haven't left yourself a big enough base to, to foundation to put paint on. So you might need to extend your dark colors so that your bright colors have more you know area to sit on too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Honored first, what's going on? All right, so let me catch up to you real quick. Been painting faster than I can. Well, I have a small... <laughs> Are you saying mine's bigger? Yep. Dun, dun. <laughs> you guys heard it here first. <laughs> I hate when I have to paint the edges with the tip of the brush like this, like draw them on. But. This sculpt is so soft in this area that I can't use the side of the brush. It'll give me a real thick line. Okay, this sculpt rolls along the edges here. It is honored first. It's from Impact Miniatures. I'm sure that that's what it is. Thank you, Ski. Ski. It's my first time. Ski, what's happening? All right. So I don't eat up too much of our time. I'm going to just do the helm. We're going to retreat back to just doing the helm because if I spend a lot of time doing the the back area here. I keep saying that, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Screw it. Screw it. We'll just do it anyway. Yeah, we're showing Jen the ropes on non-metallic. 
way down at the bottom of the screen. Is that better? Um, I don't know how to go. Yeah, the, camera angle, the, the camera <laughs> angle. The camera angle. As soon direction. as I, as soon as I figure out where it needs to be, move. I move my yeah. whole mat. Is the problem? Oh, yeah. Like I move the placemat yeah. that I got, yeah, and then I'm then I'm all off of all <laughs> off of center again like that. Right. So again, I I chose this middle ground to kind of be the brightest area. So I'm gonna keep that. I'm gonna do a couple of spots where it looks like maybe there's a ding in the helmet. Throw some texture on there. Spray painted marks on the ground today, so. Oh, yeah, good. Maybe they've had them. like the oil company come and gas, oil well, gas and gas was has first. To come. Gas was the one that they've already flagged. That was last week. Okay. Um, so. Hopefully, we get freaking internet at the office so I can move the studio to our new office. If for no other reason, I don't think it changes the stream much. If for no other reason, then I can be at the office while Jen's working. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I was over there and it's just like, oh, this is it's not much fun at all. very, very dull. Happening upstairs, like today they were moving stuff, or maybe it was yesterday. Because oh, you could hear like chairs scooting. It sounded like they were moving all kinds of furniture. And <laughs> like, is there a snowmobile in? Stuff scooting around and. Mm -hmm. Well, at rest, it's essentially the same as working from home because it's still working. I mean, there's still no one to. Oh, are, are you talking about me? I still ask him questions. It's actually more annoying now. It's more annoying when I'm not there. It, yeah. it, annoying is not a good word because you're not annoying, but it's well, the situation it annoying. becomes annoying because annoying we me. can't. Yeah. We can't, like, we used to just be able to yell across the room, you know, or the house, like, hey, babe, what's the deal with the such and such and thus and so? not so much right now right so now there's nothing that allows us to say that all right so now the deal is we're going to take some ivory let's just use ivory you're gonna use ivory i don't think i have ivory i think my ivory is over there with you oh no oh i thought i had some here where did i put my ivory is this it ivory? okay i do have ivory i just don't okay. have bright ivory oh, okay i hid my bright ivory for myself or threw it in yours or something I have I don't it. Know. <laughs> or something all right, so we're just gonna take the ivory and now we're gonna start mixing ivory in with the uh, yellow ochre. So, so far, this is a three color deal, right? So this is, uh, the way we're doing it here is mahogany as a base rather than an umber. Uh, if you want kind of a reddish gold or more of a coppery color, you can do that. Uh, and then the yellow ochre as the base yellow. It's the best, in my opinion, way to go because it gives you kind of a dirty yellow and then you add ivory to the yellow ochre. So this is gonna be just a three color mix and it's the same way except that, make sure I don't have paint all over my fingers. The same way we did on Friday doing all the uh, metallic, the non-metallic on Vulcan, right? We got this all finished on Friday and it was just using yellow ochre and dark umber and in this case, ivory flesh, one of the new colors that we've got coming out. I wanted to try how ivory fresh lo flesh looked in uh, as opposed to just uh, standard ivory. And uh, so that was just three colors. Right, so you can see you can get a lot of dynamic nature into your metallics just by using three colors, uh, a dark, a mid-tone, and a light. Um, in the case of silver, you'd use black, you'd mix a black gray, and then you'd have white, and you'd just kind of mix those together as you need to go darker and brighter. And you can get a lot of dynamic flow and, and uh, volumes and shine and uh, everything you're looking for uh, very simply. So you don't need 50 million colors. Now we're not talking about adding reflective color back in yet, like on steels, adding blues and things like that. So, you know, we're just going with the basics. Uh, you're gonna take some yellow ochre. Mm -hmm. I need more yellow ochre, you got it? Yeah. And you're gonna mix a brighter version of yellow ochre by about, um, you know, what I call a 50-50 mix, right? Okay. You're gonna wanna look at uh, yellow ochre and ivory together to get a color that's you know pretty well in between them as far as value goes. 
probably like that. I'll show you guys. We're looking at yellow ochre, ivory, and this is the mix we're going for right here. Kind of halfway in between as far as brightness goes. Can you check mine? Yeah, perfect. And it's not a science. It's it's like just, you know, kind well, of whatever. I don't know. I, just, I initially wouldn't have gone that bright, probably. I'm actually going to switch down to a smaller brush. I'm going to switch down to my number one niter. Why? Uh, just so I can get a little bit of a finer point. And as I apply pressure, it won't widen out. A number two, as I apply pressure, will make that, that line go thicker. Okay. You're already at a small enough brush that I don't think it matters for you. I switched to a two. Oh, as long as it's got a good point, you got a light yeah, hand. You got a very light point. hand, so you it's, can probably use it. I'm just switching over new. here because I've got to do these these very narrow yeah, yeah, yeah. lines here. Okay. Okay. So what I want to do here, if you can see this, is I'm going to go in now at the very top edge of that yellow ochre that I put in there, right? And I'm going to in this case, I'm just going to kind of stipple an edge because of the shape of the model right there. Right. See how I'm adding that shine? So just right up, right up at the very top. Right of up. You're still painting yourself into a corner. You had that mid yellow, then your yellow ochre, now this color. So just less and less paint as we go. And I probably went a little thin because you want it to be fairly opaque. Key here is not to overtake the other colors that you put down. So in this case, I don't want my yellow ochre to get hidden by this color. So it's literally just this little bitty band of it, of brightness up at the top. Okay. And see now what's happening? You're oh, look at hers. Look at that. That looks freaking awesome. Yeah. Up there it looks fine, down here it looks messy. <laughs> yeah, with the speed we're doing this at, it's not going to be perfect. We're really talking more and wanting to focus more on placement of color to get the idea across. Then as you get used to that, then you start working on your blends, smoothing it out. Mm -hmm. If you're worried right now about getting smooth, clean looking paint on the model, you're never gonna get the idea of metallic. Okay. So wipe that part out of your mind. Right. As hard as that may it's be. hard for me. Yeah, as hard as that may be, wipe the cleanliness part out of your, your brain at this point, And you really just want to focus on getting the colors where they need to go to trick the mind into seeing a shine where there isn't any. This is, it's one of the hardest things as an artist or as an individual, you know, in general is just to kind of set aside the, what we have defined as quality of our paint in the past, smooth blends and all of that. And just get back to learning, playing, and then work because you guys and gals already know how to make your smooth blends. But what you're going to find is if you, if you, as you try to learn reflective surface painting, like non-metallics and such, and you're worried about smooth blends, you'll lose the reflective nature of it because you'll take up too much space with your blend. You'll lose colors. You'll start taking, because we're talking about an area of the width of the tip of the brush that I'm putting on paint right now. You know, so to worry about as you're learning, blending that with the surface next to it is going to drive you nuts. So don't even sweat it. I'm going to go with a little bright dot up at the top of each of these areas here. I'm going to create a little bit of a false texture that doesn't exist. Make it look like there's another ring of detail up around the top.
just to give it a little additional shine. You're right over it. And again, we want to grab the the littlest dot of paint on the top of all of these rivet things. Um, this is one of the hardest things to do because you don't want to, again, overtake the yellow that was there. So you're, I'm literally just kind of feather tapping this brush on here, hoping to get a tiny, tiny dot of ivory over the top of that bright yellow that I've already put on each of these so that I don't make the yellow go away. If you're not careful here, you'll cover up all of your previous color and then you lose the, the shine quality. You don't want that ivory to sit right on top of your darkest color. Right? Basically having to go in and, like I said, the most minute amount of paint makes the biggest difference in all of these situations. Here on this edge, like this corner right above the eye here, we're literally gonna go in and put a dot of paint right on the corner. A little dot of paint right in the nook on that one. A little dot of paint on these rivets. There, maybe a dot of paint along the back edge. Oh, I'm literally just barely putting any paint on here at all. Uh, I will go and stipple a little bit of shine right along the back edge of that. Right up here on the crest of the nose. There. Dot in between. You can throw a little bit of dot into your darkness that gives it some texture. So, again at the crest of the nose here. You're welcome, Russ. So, not at the crest of the nose, right here at the corner. Corner. Not in the middle. Not in the middle. These dots are literally just break points to show like maybe there's no you know, like dings and ripples in it so there's literally just a i don't know how close i can get here without it starting to fuzz out see i mean it doesn't get smaller than that right see that little dot that little dot those make all the difference because now it gives a texture to that edge that otherwise mm -hmm. didn't have any texture <clears throat> but notice how that's the smallest amount of paint you'll ever put on a dang model but it has such a huge effect here Really just that much brightness up by the ear. Go in and barely tap a little ivory onto each of those. There. See what's happening? We're getting this really cool, I don't even know what color I'd call this. I really like this metallic effect that we're getting out of these colors. And again, notice how I kept my shine right through here. So here's that bright shine on that ring, then the bright shine here on the temple, and then the bright shine on the corner. That's the kind of thing you have to look for, is as you've picked a bright shine area, make sure that you move all your bright shine of all the surfaces around it to kind of that be in that area. How you doing over there? Yeah. Holy hell, you're killing it. <laughs> it's just, I don't understand. How does she always knock it out of the park every time? Now here, on these round areas where I, I picked my shine to go right across here, 
your line, your edge highlight will not start at the top bright. It'll start right here, right? So I've got this brightness here. My edge brightness will only be right along that same area where we created that shine. See how I did that? So my edge highlight on this one is bright right where I picked that shine spot and gets darker as it goes away from that, right? So that's the key. Whereas before you just pulled a line. Now your line has to kind of start right from the center in this case almost. And extend out and away from that shine spot in both directions. And look how those two right there look different than the ones next to them. Look at this guy earlier. I was like, oh, he'll be perfect. It's really simple. <laughs> and I'm like, this is a pretty complex shape now that I'm really into it. Again, I'm just, I'm not pulling the whole line. I'm in this kind of 50%, 30% area right in the middle. One of the most difficult, but I think still one of the most rewarding ways of painting. Because when you get done and you've really been able to pull it off to trick the eye into thinking it's a material that it's not, that goes way beyond most of our color placement on models. And really kind of amplifies the ability that we have to tell stories with our artwork. And the first time comes around and somebody looks at your model and says, wait a minute, there's no metallic paint on that? And you're like, no, sir. Bit of brightness. Here again. Again, I've already shown myself where to put this paint because I'm just going towards the edge of all that pure yellow ochre that I put in there. Around the model right there, it's not letting me put paint through that guy. Little dot in right there. the back I don't know why I'm so such a bland shape
Hobo Jojo, we used um, mahogany, yellow ochre, and ivory. Those three. Yeah, kind of a weird uh, usage of it on my end because I'm letting a lot of the mahogany show through just as kind of a kind of a play around with the colors and see what I got. I'm really digging it though. And her lantern you can see with that that kind of dark mahogany in the shadows just looks great. Okay, so we're at that point. Last but not least, pure ivory. You don't have to do this. This is where you choose how shiny you want it to be. Right? In my case, let's just assume it's like polished royal. We're already there. We might as well go. So now I'll just take the pure ivory on the brush. I need to make sure your brush is a little damp, but you're not trying to thin the paint out necessarily. You just want it to be able to flow off the tip. Right. And this is that your last dot of color has the biggest impact. So let's just go in with the bright ivory and put it right where on the edge where that mix hit. Brush it all. There we go, that'll work. Not gonna pull this along the edge hardly at all. I'm just literally putting a little bitty dot of ivory. And again, look at those three that I just did versus the other ones around it. Now you're really putting that final pop together. This is the least amount of paint you'll use. You won't put it in all the places that you want because you'll feel like I gotta do the whole model this way. No, all right? So as a matter of fact, let me show you. If I just do right around here. If I do just the top like that, how about that? Where now I've got a much brighter shine across the front of the brow and then it fades around. I still get that shine all the way around, but I'm not gonna do ivory all the way around the crest of the helmet. Right? I'm just doing it towards the forehead, see? Now I get that shine extends around the back, but that ivory is not there, right? So it gives it a very good kind of unbalanced shine that gives us a light source again. Now I got it. Now that I've done that, I got to keep everything on the model feeling the same. So I'm going to go in on this spike on the top of the helmet. Do ivory towards the front of the spike. All dot here, but not on the back. I chose this so that I could hit this nose piece because I really like the way this looks up here. So again, just a small dot of brightness there. And then we're going to bring it just there at the top of the bridge of the nose. Dot on the corner. down on the corner of those and just the briefest of touch of the brush on some of these areas Not. and then again on these rivets that are in that area defined by where I put the ivory so I'm only going to go as far as I went with the ivory on the top part Sense? little bit right here. 
hope you guys can get a feel for how little paint I'm putting on this model right now. Because this is the key. Otherwise, you over-highlight. We already had somebody mention it in chat. It starts looking like a disco ball. There's just too much going on. And we've spent zero time trying to blend colors here. Zero time worrying about it. Now, because of the shape of this cowl on the back of the helmet, it lays flat again. So we are going to go ahead and catch this central area here. This shine. Frost said, hey, I just got my Pro Curls in the mail. Not only is bottle great design, I love the flow of the paints as well. Awesome. Yay. Glad you're digging them. Have fun painting. I'm excited to see what you do with them. Said, completely off topic, but just out of interest, why is it your Pro Curl doesn't seem to separate anywhere near as much as all my other paints? Better paint? It's better. Better paint? I mean, I'm just saying. Because <laughs> we do this all day, every day? Right? And in an hour and 41 minutes of yapping on stream, we've been able to show Jen how to make an exceptional freaking lantern. Look at that. Well, it looks even better on yours. Look at that. <laughs> right? Look at that. Are there any spots you can see that I need to fix? Baby, you nailed it. Other than leaving this back spot in shadow, like yeah. you didn't do anything back here, yeah. but that's fine. You know what to do. Like that would have gleam on okay. the top of those dots again, areas okay. that poke away. You can leave most of it dark to show that it goes into shadow, okay. but you'll want to pick out like that little ball. See yeah. how you got the middle ones? That yeah. would still happen back there Okay. because they poke out into a little bit of light. You might yeah. not go as bright. Like you might not take them to ivory. You might just leave them at yellow ochre plus a little bit of ivory okay. or maybe even just a little bit of yellow ochre. But get don't let it be where you have a panel of all mahogany like this, yeah. right? But you can choose, like as things are in the in the shadows, like towards the back of the hat like that, leave it with just mahogany and then that first mix. And okay. then the dots of highlight are just yellow ochre. Okay. It still gives you the value, but shows you that it's all darker. Okay. And then in the for forward areas, bring them up like you have here. Okay. Right? But that's, I mean, that's, I mean, it's perfect. I mean, it's literally perfect. Like this area right here, I want everybody out there to look. <laughs> at what just a little bit of time and following along with what I just told you can do, right? That's gold, right? She's created brass or gold or whatever. That's it. Fantastic job. I mean, that's literally, that's, I can't. If, if you did this in one of the classes or like, I mean, this is basically a class, doing that, I'd be like, you got it. Now, the hard part is taking what I've told you and separating it from the shape of the model like we talked about and thinking in terms of it all being process. Mm -hmm. It's all start with a dark color, yeah. then highlight it up with a, a almost as dark color, just a little bit higher mm -hmm. in, uh, in value to get it those volumes back mm -hmm. as if it weren't metal or reflective at all. Then with your third color, start punching in where you want the shine, right? right? And start finding the shine across that shape. And that's going to take studying the shape that you're painting mm -hmm. because you can't just recreate what she's done here with this vertical linear shine and all of that on a dome. It's not going to work the same, right? You get a, a situation like this and notice how my shine is completely different in its shape, right? But achieves the same goal. I, just want to fix it. I let a lot more of the mahogany show. You can see how color-wise, too, it changes, right? These are two totally different colored metals. What happened, Grins? <laughs> I'm not going to do it, Grins. Nice, Just Frost. The Priestess is one of my favorite models out of the uh, Matriarch. Although they're all good. I think in order of my preference, it's Priestess, Feral, Noble right now. And then the limited edition one is probably also at the top. I don't know. They're all so great. Yellow Ochre is a new color, Drax. Yes. Yep, it'll be coming in the first expansion. You'll get Yellow Ochre, uh, Burnt Orange, uh, Ivory Flesh... Uh, shadow flesh. Um, what's the other flesh color? 
Shadow Flame. Oh, uh, Black Brown. Yeah, there's 24 new colors. Eight of those are our transparents. And uh, and 16 are normal hues. Right, so you get like the yellow green. All sorts of really great colors coming in the expansion. Bottles are in uh, the Canadian warehouse. Paints are on the way. So as soon as we get to where we can start mixing and bottling, I think next week. So that'll be awesome. We'll be bottling then the, the first week of June, which should make us not too far off. We've, we've said, you know, mid-June, late May, early June. We're only going to be a couple weeks off of what I think we our target was, so that's good. It's good. <laughs> you're used to messenger you're not getting a direct line to message me in messenger <laughs> can you imagine what my days would be like if everybody that wanted to talk to us could just message me oh my god i'd, I'd be the worst guy on the planet because i'd miss everybody's messages that's all i can guarantee out of that one keep going at it russ literally just keep thinking in these steps and this process that we're talking about and you'll find yourself getting it i mean it it i hope that today i was able to scale it in such a manner that it shows you the simplicity of how to place color there is that that question mark of studying the shape you're doing because all shapes reflect light differently flat surfaces versus curved surfaces right convex versus concave surfaces if they're curved uh cylinders versus cones uh, you know, versus spheres versus cubes, right? So you have to start thinking and, and looking at these shapes and just in a cursory example of, okay, is my light reflecting linearly or is it curving around the surface like what I've done here? You know, how is it actually responding to the shape? And you have to start committing that to memory. If you really want to commit yourself to doing reflective surface as well, then that's the kind of work you have to do. Um, there are simple ways, like I said, to just get high contrast on a shape and go from very dark to very bright real quick with an edge highlight, and you can fool it to looking a little metallic, but as soon as you throw another shape with the same type of example on it, it loses it, right? Until you can find the way reflectivity works because the models are all off in different angles. You got an arm here and a sword going off in the other direction and so on and so forth. So you can't really get away with painting them all in that in that kind of, uh, um, you know, simplistic, uh, non-metallic method because your eye will start to have that hmm issue where it's like it sort of looks like it's supposed to be metal but then this one over here is done the exact same way but goes in a different direction and the the shine isn't the you know isn't different so it'll be one of those where you're always kind of you won't know what the issue is but there'll always be an issue for you different shapes and angles on space marine armor well really when you break it down everything is a you know, uh, a cylinder, a cube, a sphere, or a cone. Did I cover them? Yeah. They're all some version of that, right? Facets on a gem are a flat surface like on a cube, so they're going to reflect the same way. Um, you know, this helmet is is spherical, but also has some aspects of cylinders because of the, the striations in it, right? The little dents and dings in it are going to make each one of these little rolled things like a cone or a cylinder, right? They have a round shape this way as you go through all the pillow tuck Kind of issue but the whole thing is a dome so that's a more complex shape granted right but then you've got um you know you've got these flat surfaces out here are more like the sides of cubes right edging even though they have a little bit of concave to them i didn't really take that into account much you know and i started doing them more like the flat sides of cubes this one back here more cylindrical right even though it's a very big curve more like a cylinder where I go with my shine very narrow up top and then it broadens as it gets out towards the edge, right? So if you just learn those basic geometric shapes, you'll be able to get through almost anything, right? You'll just find that certain shapes become compounds of those. You might have a flat surface on a space marine that then rounds at the edges. And so you've got to break it into its component parts and say, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight this like it's a cube, a reflective cube, and then cylinders on the sides, things like that. So you start thinking in terms of breaking things down into their constituent basic geometric forms and not worrying about diamonds and triangles. Triangles are literally just cubic shapes, the way they reflect without all of the, you know, it's only half of the, the side of a cube in some cases because of the triangular shape or a quarter or a third or whatever it is, right? Pyramids, 
I guess we could add into that. It's kind of like a, a, it takes the, the, the combo between cones and cubes to paint a pyramid shape. But I treat it just like a cube, like a flat surface reflection. You know, and the cube is the only one of those that's flat surface. And then you've got cylinders, which are curved and, and you know, long. Uh, well, they don't have to be long. But they are going to radiate light differently than a sphere. You know, a sphere has radius in 360 degrees. But that's, that's literally how to how to bust it down to a point where hopefully it becomes more palatable is reduce it down to as few things that you have to remember and that's the way to do it right and like i said it's very frustrating because some people just don't brain the same way right <laughs> it, it, it's, i mean that's the easiest way for me to yeah. say it is that the way we relate to what we see and how our brain interprets it is is different from person to person and and me, the fortunate kind of unfortunate thing is I look at things and kind of my brain immediately goes into the how that works. Why is that mode? And so I'm always crunching things apart. Like I'm breaking it apart internally in my brain as I'm visualizing it or seeing it in the world. And I'm saying, oh, that's because that does X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C. And so that logical scientific part of my brain just kind of is always going on in the background, which is both a pain and a blessing. For some people, their creativity comes from just throwing it at the model. And so if you feel like you're constricting yourself too much by having to think about, oh my God, it's this shape versus that shape. I don't feel like I want to do it. Just start highlighting a model. Like I showed you today and like Jen did, you just pick a spot you want to start your shine from, right? When I threw this shine around the circle of this, it's not that I've ever seen a helmet like this. I was just like, I'm going to start right here along the bend and I'm going to put my brightness there, right? So try it, right? Try putting your your brightness right at the top and then follow the steps that I've shown you as far as how to place your color once you've said, okay, I want the shine to be right there and then just start working with it and see what you get. And if you don't like it, take and paint over it, you know, again and then pick a different spot of brightness. Do it with just a simple panel of armor, right? Um, take a, you know, take a sword, right? Real quick, like this and take, you know, dark gray paint dark gray and some white out and we'll just do a real quick silver sword I'm just gonna do this in gray and white two colors black gray and white I'm gonna put on the palette quick that put my eyes on what do we got we got uh seven minutes <laughs> right never in the history of ever have i painted anything in seven minutes right so let's just real quick uh, i'm gonna zoom in just a hair make it full screen no i want people to see your lamp your lamp you killed it so oh, i'm just gonna i'm done i'm not doing anything right? you're just leaving your lamp up there because people can see that your first attempt at this was knock it out of the park good right We'll take the gray and the white and again mix a color that is just a hair up in value from the dark gray you know which means you know still dark right and start thinking in terms of where i want that shine let's do it right at the tip right so just the tip i'm going to bring this quote unquote brighter gray it's actually going to give me a little bit of wet blending because i'm moving fast enough which is actually good i don't want to have that be something that people think you have to do though Right. And just a little bit along the edge like that then maybe just because we'll do a little bit of uh, secondary reflection on the bottom side of the blade here and the time we got I'm be surprised if I can paint both sides of the blade right. then we go a little bit brighter so I'll put a little bit more white in here and this is where I'm going to decide where my shine goes is with this color right and so my shine I want on the uh, very tip of the blade. Let's just do it like this. Like I said, just try it. Say, okay, well, the tip is high up towards my light source here, so I'm just going to throw brightness towards the tip of the blade. Obviously the edge, too. And then a little bit of a secondary reflection area back here. 
and then I want to catch the length of the blade in the center because it has that bevel to it, right? Let me go brighter. We've just now sectioned off where we need stuff to go. So I'm just going to keep adding white to my gray. Pull towards that brightness where that ultimate shine is going to be, which is right up here. Pull that along the edge a little bit. Then I've got this secondary reflective area back here. We're going to let that kind of have that shine be right here. And then do my edge out of that. Again, kind of draw this real quick. I'm doing this with a big fat number four brush, so bear with me. Probably should go down to a smaller brush here. So, then I'll just go to real bright gray, almost pure white. Again, just paint myself into a corner. Here's where I'm going to hate having a big brush. As a matter of fact, I'm going to switch. Just gonna start bitching here in a second. <laughs> gonna drop down to a number two. Again, pull my line back here. Where I stop taking the shine all the way down the length of the sword. And then pure white. Again, don't want a whole lot of paint on the, the brush. And I'm just going to kind of grab that pure white. Very tip. Extend that edge highlight. Oop, that's exactly what I did want to do. Extend that edge highlight out of the shine at the tip just a little bit. So, that. then again, right along here. Again, I'm just pushing myself further and further along, right? Now I'm going to go thin line of bright white so I don't cover up any of that other gray that I did. And then bring a little bit of edge highlight out of that. And then same right here. Can put a couple of nicks in the blade where you get. Right. So Russ said, my the biggest thing I'm taking away from today's lesson is to use many more layers than I do currently and don't expect the effect to look right until the fifth or sixth layers at the earliest. Till you get that brightest color starting to happen is really when it'll start to come around, yes. Right. And I can add some of these detail lines. When you have a flat surface, you can pull like little reflective shine, almost like scratches. Keep them going in the same direction if you want them to look like they're reflective. One back here, maybe. Just using the side of my brush and whipping it along a little bit. All right, and there you go. That was, uh, I don't know, seven minutes? Almost exactly, I think. All right. So seven minutes, and you start getting reflective look on a sword. Now, because my blend went for a longer distance, this doesn't look as shiny as this. Right? The sword looks duller. So the closer you bring your darkest color, right, and the shorter that fade is, 
the shinier the object will become. All right, so you get to play around with that. But I mean, that for just doing real simple, that works. That's a dirty, beat up sword. Right? Gave it some texture. Looks like it's banged up a little bit. And that can be as simple as you starting out to learn non metallic right there. And that gets you built up into kind of the feel for, uh, you know, how you're putting your colors on, staging them correctly, like we've talked about today, which is really just start with that dark color, move into setting up your volumes like you would with any paint. It's no different. And then with that third layer, and I don't want to say it's always the third layer. It depends on how detailed you're going. Sometimes if I'm doing very, very fine, well-blended, you know, like very high-end non-metallic, it might be the fourth or fifth layer when I start to really dial in the shine because I've spent a lot of other layers blending in my shadows and my dark reflections first. But if you're just doing it like this, that kind of sketching mentality, do your dark color, do a not-so-dark version of that uh, as a value shaping, just a general lighting, almost like a pre-highlight kind of version of that color. Then with your third layer, go with a brighter color. Like in our case, we went with just uh, uh, on the third layer that, uh, that I think it was a brighter blend of the mahogany and the yellow ochre. We didn't quite go to yellow ochre then. And that was the third color. And then you say, this is where my shine is going to go. That's when I put that color in that band around the helmet, right? And then I went to yellow ochre after that, then mix yellow ochre with ivory, you know, then maybe you do it a little bit less yellow ochre with the ivory, and then finally the ivory. It depends on the surface that you're working on, how much space you have. Remember that small, small detail areas are not gonna get that much color on them because if you try to go in with six colors on, you know, this little part of Vulcan's wing here, right? And you try to get six colors in there, you'll find yourself very frustrated. So maybe you only get three, you know? And then you use six colors when you get larger surfaces like the top of the gold or like right in here on this this wrist piece and stuff. You can do more detail, right? So don't feel like you got to push every piece of the model because, I mean, look at some of the stuff we've done here, right? Like these Roman numerals here doing those in, in non-metallic, you know, you're not going to get seven colors to show there. There's just not enough space to put seven colors on there. If you did, it'd look like little beads of color and it wouldn't look like what you want it to. So remember that you don't have to have the same amount of color on every detail bit. There's not the same amount of color on these little rivets because they just won't take it, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's more color and blending on the top here where I have more surface area of that gold showing and back here where I have more surface area of the gold showing on the backpack than there are in the small details. But they all follow the same principle. It's just that I might find myself without as much space so I don't use as dark of a color on a small bit. I start with a mid-tone color and then work up to my brightness or I don't go as bright. It's up to you. Play around with it. There you go. And eventually you can do this. Ta-da, Vulcan. Right? But all of these are done with the same principled steps, right? Jen's lamp, right? Vulcan's armor, the head on the elephant we just did in an hour and a half today, and this guy that we did in seven minutes, right? It's just the level of detail you want to go, how sketchy you want it to be. A lot of times I'll do rough stuff like this as I'm starting the model just to get a feel if, if that's the way I want the shine to look, and then go back and blend all of it in start using finer colors, spending more time, but this will show me where I want my shine. Is that as dull as I want it, or do I want it to be a shinier, more polished blade? Move those brightness and put more darkness and contrast in there. You know, So it lets you figure it out as you go. You've got a new update. We didn't change it. We need to say it's only, what were we gonna change it to only? Oh, yeah, only and, critical updates or something. And you can do this, right? Like hers is as good as any of mine. That's fantastic. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. She nailed it. Nailed it in one. She always does that. I never know why I'm surprised. But uh, I think that's my thing, though, is that I can do it really well the first time, and then after that, it's not as good. Like, I'm beginner's luck. And then it, <laughs> and then it goes away. That's good. We always have that one to hold up and say, this was the first attempt <laughs> I did. First non-metallic. I have my first airbrush. Yeah, exactly. You haven't gotten to the point where you're throwing models at walls yet, but it's not far off. I don't give up. Don't give up. It is a tough one to do. So, you know, when you're trying these more advanced techniques like reflective surfaces, um, you know, you just have to kind of bear in there and take a break from it. Take a breather. Have a test model that you keep coming back to and keep trying and keep trying to throw paint at it until something clicks. Keep asking questions here because I keep trying to find different ways to say the same thing and it doesn't always click. You know, some methods, like I show somebody this method today and they don't get it at all, but I show them a different method of the way that I do it, you know, and they'll be like, now it makes perfect sense to me. 
you know, so it really just depends on, you know, everybody's kind of personal way of painting and what clicks and what doesn't click. So there's always that too. So again, with that, we're out of here. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Hopefully this has helped. I might throw this one up on uh, YouTube. This seems like a good one for YouTube because, uh, especially because you knocked it out of the park. So we can say, see, it really works. <laughs> no, no magic tricks here. So uh, thanks for hanging with us and being part of the show. We will be back on Thursday. It's my birthday. I yeah. actually get to stream on my birthday. So uh, I'll be like 28 years old on Thursday. Mm-hmm. So uh, <laughs> take that. I'm prematurely gray. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, Thursday is my birthday stream. Maybe we'll do something fun. We'll still be here streaming uh, 4 p.m. as normal and uh, hanging out and having some good times. So Right? Exactly. A cat herder, right? Right? <laughs> Lando, take it easy. Thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for all the new follows, subs, resubs, and all that. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, Don't do anything we wouldn't do. Love your faces, and we'll catch you on Thursday. Adios, gang.